Minister Halid El Fale, Excellencies, friends, ladies and gentlemen, allow me first to thank the El Subay family for the honor of addressing you today. It's been many years since I last visited Saudi Arabia, maybe nine years ago. I must confess that when I read the 2030 report, my instinct was to dismiss it as another glossy report written by consultants. But over the years, I could see for myself serious moves made to carry out the broad objectives laid out in that report. I arrived here a few days ago and gave a lecture at the El Faisal University where I talked about Islam in the multipolar world. But what surprised and gladdened me was to see the vivaciousness of the campus environment of young men and women full of energy with a twinkle in their eyes and it gave me a sense of the future. Saudi Arabia is an important pole in the world and the shifting of that pole has worldwide effects. I watched with great interest uh, on video the welcome accorded to China's President Xi Jinping last December. Being from the diplomatic profession, I understood the symbolism expressed in the ceremony and in the formality of that visit. First, Saudi Arabia, then the GCC countries, and then the entire Arab world. A very different quality from the reception given to President Trump some years ago. It signaled a shift in the region's stance, a shift which aligns itself with the world becoming increasingly multipolar. A signal sent not just to people in the region, but to the entire world. The rise of China has really created a situation where the entire developing world now sees that it can find its own path to the future. It used to be, we were told, that the only way to the future was to follow in the footsteps of the West. And naturally, we fell short. And we were judged. We were given advice. Occasionally, we were punished for not following in those footsteps. Singapore, for many years in this early growth, received lectures from the West. And I remember Lee Kuan Yew once telling American friends, he said, look, if you make me a 51st date, then I'll follow you. But if not, I've got to look after myself, my own economic development and my own security. But China's rise gives inspiration to the entire developing world, that they too can find their own way. Southeast Asia, India, Africa, Latin America, the Middle East. And it seemed for a while that China was in the crosshairs of the Americans, who saw in China's rise not a threat to America, but a threat to America's dominance in the world. And for those of us who studied in America, who lived in America, who grew up with an affection for America, to see how anti-China sentiments 
almost become McCarthyite in the last few years was deeply distressing. And in East Asia, there is great worry that it could lead to war. Taiwan could be a trigger, the South China Sea could be a trigger, North Korea could be a trigger. But there is a certain nervousness, almost a feeling that we can hear the sound of distant thunder. So when this balloon incident happened, our instinct was to become worried. This morning when I woke up, I read two reports. One, that the balloon was shot down, or the balloon was pricked. And the other, that on February the 3rd, China dismissed its Director General of Customs. Sorry, Director General of Meteorological Services. Just a bland report. I don't think it has been covered in the international media yet. But the signal is that this thing will blow over, literally. When Blinken cancelled his visit, which would have been now, they put it, both sides put it, as a postponement. There is, in the short term, a temporary relaxation of tension between the US and China. This is my, my belief, more than a hope. The Ukraine war is probably the reason for this. And it led to the long meeting between Biden and Xi Jinping in Bali. Over three hours, simultaneous interpretation, which meant over three hours of solid conversation, principally, principally between the two men. In Ukraine, the protagonists, Russia, Ukraine, Europe, America, are willy-nilly ratcheting each other into a long dark tunnel, out of which they cannot back out, with no light at seen yet at the end. The West cannot afford for Putin to win, and Putin cannot afford to lose. How do you square that circle? And by little escalations, high mass, tanks, longer range missiles, drones, the risk of something dreadful happening increases. And there's no easy solution now. Even Kissinger, who used to talk about the unwisdom of bringing Ukraine into NATO, now concedes that Ukraine may have to join NATO because what has happened has happened. To me, it almost seems inevitable that long-term partition will happen. It would take years for a ceasefire to be negotiated, like what we saw in Vietnam and in Korea. In the coming months, the reality on the battlefield will change. Russia will try to incorporate all the Russian-speaking areas. I'm not sure if it wants to go beyond, if it, even if it could. America and the West, now tanks, tomorrow longer range missiles, we do not know what else. Russia, sensing that this is not a war about Ukraine, but a war against Russia, increasingly talks about the possibility of having to defend itself with nuclear weapons. So all this soaks up tremendous intellectual and nervous energy in Washington. And even ammunition stocks in the Pacific 
are being run down to supply Ukraine. So that, to me, is the real reason why U.S.-China relations are enjoying a slight reprieve. It's only slight. Because the long-term concern with China will not go away. The Americans want China to side them against Russia. This will never happen. Because China knows that if Russia goes through a regime change, then all the, the entire West will now be focused on diminishing China. So it is in China's interest to keep Russia going as a separate pole. But China calibrates it because it had its links to Europe and it wants to maintain a cold peace with America. So it kept a 60-40 stance, 60% favoring Russia, 40% in the other direction. After Bali, I think it moved towards 55-45. But China will never turn against Russia. When I was in government, I used to sit next to Russian ministers because Singapore is S, Russia is R. And I learned from them that between China and Russia, there is a very simple understanding that in East Asia, China will not, Russia will not undermine China's position. And that in the European Middle Eastern sphere, China will not undermine Russia's position. A very simple agreement, but only simple agreements are sustainable over the long term. And you can still see it happening. And there's much talk that Xi Jinping, later this month, will visit Moscow. And he maintains a very close relationship with Putin. The growth of China is, of course, a challenge to everybody. China's per capita GDP today is only one quarter that of the US, or less. If China's GDP, per capita GDP, reaches half that of the US, its GDP will be equal to that of the EU and US combined, more or less. And its consumption, its consumer market, in the coming years, will drive the global economy the way the US economy drove the US domestic economy and consumption drove the global economy up to now. So this is a major shift in global polarity. And everyone is re-triangulating his position, anticipating that future. I mean, it's for this reason that Saudi Arabia will join BRICS. It has energy implications. It has financial implications. It has implications on international currencies. We can't avoid it becoming a multipolar world. It's difficult for the Americans to accept it because they're used to, to being the exceptional country. It's difficult for the West to accept it because they've long been used to sitting on top and looking down at the rest of us. But German companies, French companies, other European companies, they see the numbers and they know the world is changing. So the Western alliance, which became much stronger as a result of Ukraine, may not last indefinitely because the interests diverge. China's policy towards America is not to show weakness. Because if you show weakness, you invite more problems for yourself. It is to be firm, but never to escalate. It senses its own strength growing, and therefore time is on its side. 
and Ukraine may have bought China a few more years of peaceful development. In 10 years' time, militarily speaking, it will be much more difficult for the US to threaten China, even over Taiwan. So all of us, countries big and small, we take the world as it is. We have to adjust to the world. The Middle East has to adjust to the world and ask ourselves, let's say 2050, 2050, what will the world be like? 2050, China will be by far the world's biggest economy. India will be either number two or number three. And I'm talking about nominal GDP. Number four will be Indonesia. By 2050, 40% of babies born in the world will be African. Give or take a few percentage points. By 2050, 50% of babies born in the world will be Muslim. Plus minus a few percentage points. When we cast our mind into that multipolar world in 2050, the reality will be very different from what it is today. Now, in politics, even a few months is a long time, and we cannot talk about 2050 as if we are going to get there in a straight line. But like water flowing down the mountain, sooner or later, that water will flow to the sea. And understanding what the shape of the world will be in 2050 will be an important guide to all of us in our actions as countries, as companies, and even as individuals. The most important thing is to be objective, to be driven not by emotion, but by knowledge. Because of a long encounter between the West and the Middle East, there is a lot of knowledge in the West about the Middle East and a lot of knowledge in the Middle East about the West. But against what the world will look like in 2050, there are big gaps in that knowledge which in the coming years we will have to fill. China needs to know much more about the Middle East. The intricacies, the subtleties, of its culture, its protocols, its history, its society. The world has to understand Islam much more deeply and not just stereotype it. In East Asia, all of us are deepening our knowledge of China. The Middle East will have to deepen its knowledge of China. Because whether we like it or not, China will be an important part of our future. And China must also understand the world, the world better and not see itself as somehow being in the middle. In a multipolar world, everyone has more options. Which means, if you misunderstand, or miscalculate, you will find the few readjusting against you. But if you understand all the poles, the West, Russia, India, Southeast Asia, China, then you can link up with all of them. And whatever happens, you can get into a comfortable position, be a peacemaker, and benefit in the process. Thank you.